Thank you for tuning in today at Propel Church. Whether you're watching through YouTube or listening through a podcast, we want to say thank you. Our hope at Propel is that you would be propelled into an authentic relationship with Jesus. From wherever you are tuning in, we hope that you are encouraged and inspired by this week's message. I am so excited to teach today. Uh, If we have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Tori Newman. I am privileged and honored to be on staff here as our operations director. I am also, and more importantly, married to our incredible pastor, Pastor Nick Newman. Yeah, give it up for him, Um, who periodically, graciously uh, lets me have a microphone on stage. So, <laughs> um, I love Christmas. Last week, he kicked off this series with a sermon called Killing Off Scrooge. And I was like, man, this is such a great foundation to lay the rest of these sermons on for this week and then for next as well. Just talking about getting out of the funk. I mean, how many of you guys love your family? Right? Okay, we love some of y'all. Okay. (laughs) How many of you guys are also super annoyed by your family? Okay, yeah, more of you. (laughs) So our family can bring out the best in us, but sometimes they can bring out the worst in us. And I feel like around Christmas time is that time where our families, man, they know what buttons to push and they are not afraid to press them. You can be having a great year and you roll up to grandma's house and what's the first thing out of her mouth? When you get married. <laughs> or your parents are like, when are we getting some grandkids? <laughs> or or here's, here was my favorite when I was uh, um, in missions and a missionary overseas. When you get a real job. <laughs> right? It's like, thank you very much. I've had a great year. <laughs> I'm doing incredible things. And then you get me all up in my feelings and we start to get that frustration and that anger kind of bubbles up within us. And it's like, man, I was doing great till I walked in this door, so thanks for that. (laughs) But our family is, man, we love our family, but they're a little much sometimes. And around Christmas time, I think, is, is the worst. We, we get those feelings. Sometimes we see family we haven't seen in years, and sometimes there's a reason we haven't seen them in years. All right, we've got some hurt that's kind of billowed up, and it can bring out anger and frustration. And so today, the message I have titled this is Too Hot to Handle. Come on. <laughs> So we're going to dive in a little bit into anger and frustration. I want to lay the groundwork, though, because some of y'all are like, yeah, I don't really get that angry. So I'm going to read a definition so we're all on the same page. Don't check out. There's some stuff in here for you. But uh, anger, also known as wrath or rage, is an intense emotional state involving a strong, uncomfortable, and non-cooperative response to a perceived provocation, hurt, or threat, a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. How many of y'all have felt that before, (laughs) right? And and so before I get too far into this, I want to say that with anything, anger is a process. Right, when we, when we struggle, I struggle with anger. This is my vice, okay, y'all. I used to could hulk out faster than Bruce Banner on a good day, <laughs> right? Like I could go to zero, I used to, not anymore, but I could go from zero to 100 like that yeah. in my anger and my frustration. And over the last couple of years, a couple of years, the last like 10 years really, as I have really said, hey, I'm setting out because this is not gonna be something that controls me or defines me, but let me look and see what God says about it. And let me be clear, it's not about perfection. It's about a process. We are all in process. I'm not trying to get you from A to Z. I'm just trying to get you from A to B or from B to C or from C to D. That's where we're headed. It's a process and it's about doing better than you did yesterday. Not comparing yourself to anybody else, but saying, hey, man, yesterday I struggled, but I'm gonna do, make choices to do better today. And let me tell you, it is only possible through Jesus yes. and through his word, through truths. I have surrounded myself with some great people that have given me biblical truths that have pointed me time and time again back to Jesus 
And man, can I just proclaim, I am better than I was yesterday. I am better than I was 10 years ago. I am moving and I still got some stuff to work on, but I'm committed to a process, not because of perfection, but because God is still continuing to work in and through me. So it's a process, don't give up. I've got some tools, some biblical truths, some scripture for you guys. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. All right. So my main foundational scripture for today is James 1, verses 19 through 20. And it says this, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So here, James pulls out three things. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. But what does that mean and what does it look like? This is the NLT and I love what the Amplified Version says. It says this, understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters, Let everyone be quick to hear, be a careful, thoughtful listener, slow to speak, a speaker of carefully chosen words, and slow to anger, patient, reflective, forgiving. For the resentful, deep-seated, that's anger of man, does not produce the righteousness of God, which is that standard of behavior which he requires from us. So three things, we've got to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Growing up as a kid, I didn't get into a ton of trouble growing up, but, uh, but there were some times that I got in trouble, and man, it was not my fault. <laughs> it was not my fault. And how many of you guys as kids, either to your teachers or your parents or your grandparents, have been like, but if you would just listen, (laughs) I could explain to you what had happened. (laughs) And what did our parents do? Ba, ba, ba. I don't want to hear it. No, no, don't make excuses. Go to your room. And I was like, I didn't even do nothing. (laughs) But if they would just listen, man, we could have explained it. There would be no need for us to be sent to our rooms. And then what do we do as adults? Ba, ba, ba. No, 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 I don't want to hear it. Go to your room. It's 100% what we do (laughs) to our children, to our peers. Man, we are so quick to get angry and so slow to listen. Let me tell you something. We, uh, We got two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. We should take twice as much time to hear as we do to speak. And I feel like in this day and age, it's so easy to feel like the silence is uncomfortable. Like we have to say something. We can't just leave it quiet. There can't be a moment where we think about how we're gonna respond. Man, we got to respond right there in the moment. And nine times out of 10, it is out of anger and frustration that we respond. Back at, I think it was the end of last year, beginning of this year, I've seen it now come and run its course through again and again. Um, when, when there was talk of mandatory vaccination going around, on social media, there was this beautiful picture right here that would come up. And what does this say? I support mandatory vacations. <laughs> But that is not what some of y'all read on social media. <laughs> and we got all up in an uproar about something we misunderstood, didn't read properly. And I'm like over here in the comments section, like Michael Jackson and his popcorn, just like watching and reading. I'm like, you guys did not read what that said. That says vacations. I support mandatory vacations. Somebody, please make me go on a seven day cruise. <laughs> But we live in a society that is so on the edge of anger. We're ready. Man, we're ready to fight. We live right here. And this is a dangerous place 
to live. I see some of y'all parents are a little concerned for me right now. <laughs> Why? Because I'm right here on the edge. Yeah. And one false move and I'm going over and I'm gonna get hurt. But this is how we live with our anger. We're right here on the edge, ready to jump at any moment over what? The fact that we thought vacations said vaccinations and we unfriend and we unfollow and we cancel people. For what? For something that we didn't take time. We weren't slow to read and slow to listen. We were quick to make our opinions known and quick to get angry about it. I love what it says in Ecclesiastes 7, 9. Do not be anger, ang- eager in your spirit to be angry, for anger resides in the heart of fools. But this is where we live, right here on the edge, yeah. eager to be angry at literally anything, literally anything we're ready to be angry about. But we don't want anger to reside in our hearts. So what's the Bible say? Psalm 38 puts it great, or 37, verse eight, stop being angry. Stop being angry. (laughs) Boom, done, (laughs) there it is. Stop being angry, turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper, it only leads to harm. Just when I was standing up here, it only leads to harm to continue being angry. And it's easy to say that, we'll just stop being angry. My husband says that to me sometimes, we'll just stop being angry. I'm like, I can't just flip a switch like that. That's not how that works. It's not how that works. But I have learned over the years with the help of Jesus, tools as well as scripture and biblical truths that have helped me flip the switch and not live on edge, ready to be angry at everything, but being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. So I got three things for you guys today. And the first one is this, respond, don't react. Respond, don't react. And for some of y'all, you're looking at this and you're like, aren't those the same things? Isn't a reaction and a respond? Aren't they like, they're all a response, but they're different. I'm gonna preface this by saying, if you do this and get hurt, it's not my fault. I'm warning you right now. My husband scares easily, all right? I'm warning you right now, if you go out, some of you guys, he's like, oh, I'm afraid of spiders, and you send him pictures of spiders. I'm gonna say he scares easily. If you scare him and you get punched in the face, it's not my fault, okay? But it's a great illustration, so I'm gonna use it. Spooks, super easy. I don't have to scare him. I can walk in a room with his back turned, and he'll turn around and be like, ha! Right, he's in, he's in fight mode. It's a reaction that he has to something. But that's how we live sometimes. Like I didn't do anything, I literally just walked in the room. Yeah. And he turns around, ready to fight. I'm like, put your hands down, nobody else is in the house. <laughs> but that's a reaction, yeah. not a response. See, it's not thought out, it's instinct, it's ready to go, fist cocked back, ready to just one, two. And that's how some of us live, we're on, we're in fight mode. We don't have to be in fight mode. This is what the Kaleidoscope group defines both of them as, it says when we react, many times it's instinctive, reciprocal or in opposition to a particular situation or person. That reaction may be favorable, or most of the time it's not, depending on how you feel. Side note here, your feelings change like that. They cannot be the basis and the foundation on which you build your life, because they change. One minute you're great, the next you're not. Your feelings, the way that you live has to be built on a foundation that does not change, and that's why we say to build your foundation on Jesus because he is the rock that does not change. Responding, while technically a reaction, takes into consideration the desired outcome of the interaction. 
Reacting is emotional. Responding is emotional intelligence. Yeah. Reacting is emotional. Responding is emotional intelligence. Okay. And that's what we're after. That's what James is talking about when he's like, hey, be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry because you may get frustrated about something that isn't actually a problem. Right. So respond, don't react. Proverbs 15, one says this, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Yeah. What you say to people in response to what they say can either deflect anger or make tempers flare. So how do we respond and not react? Predetermine your responses. Predetermine your responses. Now this seems kind of silly, like we should script out our lives. <laughs> there's, a, there's a character in Pride and Prejudice, his name is Mr. Collins, his goal is to get a wife. That is his goal in life is to get married, it'll make everybody happy. And he talks about how when he's complimenting ladies to try and get their attention, sometimes they're the spur of the moment, but other times he does arrange them ahead of time. And it's kind of silly and it's kind of weird, but the man is onto something because he knows what he wants. He's got an end game to get a wife. And you know how you get a woman? You tell her she looks nice. <laughs> You tell her she is smart, that you love what she is doing. <laughs> he knows. He's predetermined in his responses. You know why? Because he has an outcome he's trying to get to. So he's going to predetermine his responses, and that's what I'm saying. Predetermine your responses. You know your family are, is going to ask you those questions every single year at Christmas. <laughs> predetermine your responses to those questions. Why aren't you married yet? Well, I'm just waiting on God to send me the right person. When are you gonna have kids? We're trusting in God's timing and he hadn't said to have kids yet. When are you gonna get a real job? Well, actually I have a real job and I would love to tell you more about it. <laughs> Predetermine your responses and this is more than just while you're at family events. You know when you go places, people are gonna ask questions. Pastor Nick and I, we get invited to a lot of pastors and their wives outings and and there's like a series of questions that everybody asks, like literally everyone asks because this is what we have in common. Uh, how long you been married? How old is your church? How many people? Um, where are you located? Things like that. And then eventually we get around to the, do you have kids yet? Do you guys have kids? Um, nine times out of 10, we are the only people there that do not have kids. So when we say no, people are like, what? And I'm like, yeah, no, we don't have kids yet. <laughs> And for the longest time, man, it hurt every time somebody asked me that question. Because I was like, I don't know why I don't have kids yet. And, and I would start to get frustrated and angry and upset every time I would see somebody post that they were getting ready to have a baby. And it would, it would just frustrate me and there would be such anger that would rise up out of me and I said, look, I'm done doing this. We know that, that they're gonna ask these questions. So we're gonna predetermine our response to this question. And our response is this. Well, we've been trying for about five years. We've had a bunch of tests done. Everything is great. We're waiting on God's timing. We're trusting in him and we're taking next steps with our doctors and know that when it is our time to have kids, we will have kids. Right. And that's our predetermined response to that question. Yep. And it takes the emotion of the moment out of it because I can say ahead of time, this is what I know to be true, regardless of what I see or feel or think or what anybody else says. This is where I know we are. And this is what I'm gonna tell people. We predetermine our responses. And this goes beyond just thinking through of what, when people ask you things and you know, you've got those trigger questions, but this goes, for every area of your life. If you are struggling with an addiction, 
with substance abuse, with pornography, with suicidal thoughts. Predetermine your response to those things. The enemy's not that crafty. He's gonna use the same tactics over and over and over again. Because he's gonna pick something that worked one time and he's just gonna keep using it again and again and again. Predetermine your responses to those things. If you're struggling with suicidal thoughts, who have you got that you can text in that moment and say, hey, I'm struggling, will you pray for me? We encourage people that struggle with this to also, man, like get rid of all the stuff, anything that you have that you could use to take your life, get rid of it. Take that gun apart, unload it, take all the bullets out. Predetermine your response and then just run the play. Write down when you're in your right mind how you are gonna respond to each and every circumstance when you know you struggle the most. I do this, I love you guys so much. I love our church, I love the people that are here. Sometimes people leave, I have a predetermined response of how I respond to when people leave and step away. Why? Because I know that it can have the ability to take me down and take me down hard. But I say, nope, this is what I'm gonna do in this moment, and God, above all, I'm gonna trust you. So, respond, don't react. Predetermine your responses. Proverbs 14, 29 says this, one who is slow to anger has great understanding but one who is quick-tempered exalts foolishness. Slow to anger has great understanding. Predetermine your responses to those things, and that's how you get great understanding. My third thing is this, be a thermostat, not a thermometer. Be a thermostat, not a thermometer. This here, is a digital thermometer. All it does is reads the temperature of the room and reflects it on the screen. That's it. It is currently, oh wow, it's really warm up here. It's 74.1 degrees up here. <laughs> but that's all, that's all this does. It, it reads the temperature in the room and it reflects it. Yeah. That's it. This is a thermostat. Not only does it read the temperature of the room, but it controls it. Right. It determines whether it is too hot or too cold. Yeah. It determines whether we need to pull it down or we need to raise it up. Right. It's aware of what the temperature is in the room, but it has control over it. Yeah. When you walk into a room, when you walk into a situation where you feel like something is off, Anybody been there? You walk in and you're like, I just got here, but has everybody been yelling for the last 30 minutes? <laughs> you have a decision to make. You can either take in everything you feel around you and display it and take on that temperature, or you can control it. Yeah. You determine. You don't have control over a lot of things, but you have control over your actions. You determine how you feel in a moment because choices lead, feelings follow. Man, maybe it feels really, really stressful right now, but I am gonna choose to give my stress to God and trust him to take care of me in these moments. You have the ability to choose and determine your responses to things. You don't have to just reflect what you see and what you feel. So be a thermostat, not a thermometer. Proverbs 15, 18 says, a hot-tempered person starts fights. A cool-tempered person stops them. I picked this verse on purpose because of the hot and the cool. Because how many of you guys know, some, I mean, this is called too hot to handle. Y'all come in real hot. <laughs> and that's how the fights start. But if you come and you cool things down, man, you have the ability to change at least how you perceive an outcome. Maybe you just change you. Yeah. But in those moments, it is still worth it to stop a fight within yourself right. and not just let it rage and rule over you. Yeah. 
So we're going to respond, not react, predetermine our responses, and be a thermostat, not a thermometer. And these are all great. But let me tell you, anger is just the branches of a much larger tree. These are just symptoms. Anger is a response to what's happening inside of you. See, the root of these things goes a little deeper than that. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 through 32, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. See, anger is the outcome of bitterness and rage and unforgiveness. That's where it all stems from, from hurt that you have felt from people that you haven't let go of, from something that you feel like, man, if I hold on to this more, man, they'll be so hurt by this. Those are the roots of your anger. Your anger is just a symptom. It's a notification, like, just like on your car. It's, it's a notification. Hey, check your engine. Something may be off. Anger is just that. It's the check engine light of our heart that something is off inside of us. And I know some of you guys are so tired of hearing us talk about forgiveness and forgiving one another. And man, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? Peter in Matthew chapter 18 asked Jesus this question. He says, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times? Yeah, that seems like that's a good, like that's a lot. Seven is a lot to forgive somebody for hurting me. And Jesus says, no, it's not, not seven, but 70 times seven to forgive your brother. And it's not about the number because if you're counting, then you've missed it. If you're counting how many times you're forgiving somebody else, you're missing the point of forgiveness. But Jesus goes on to tell a story of what this looks like. And he says, there was a king and he was collecting all his debts. And he calls somebody in and a man, and if I did the math right, then this man owed the king upwards of $7.5 billion. And he came to the king and the king was getting ready to put him in prison to pay off his debts, which would literally be the rest of his life. And he says, please be patient with me. Give me more time, I'll pay off my debt. Just don't, don't throw me in jail. Don't take away all of my possessions. Don't take my family away and sell them. Like I'll be patient with me. And the king looks down at him and he has compassion on him and he has mercy and he forgives his entire debt, all $7.5 billion of it. And says, hey, your debt's been paid. Your slate is clean. You are free from owing me anything and sends him on his way. And on the way home, he runs across a man who owes him $12,000, which let's be honest, is it's a big chunk of change, but it's nothing in comparison of what he has just been forgiven. And he says, hey man, you owe me 12 grand. And the guy goes, hey, I'm so sorry. Like, be patient with me. I don't have your money right now, but I'm working on it. Just please be patient with me and the man's like yeah man no problem like you don't even know i just owed this guy 7.5 billion dollars and it's clean no that's actually not what happens he looks at him and says i'm gonna throw you in prison till this whole debt is paid even though he had just been forgiven a debt of 7.5 billion dollars he's holding on to this man for 12 grand and the king hears about it and he says, dude, what is wrong with you? I just forgave you this debt you could literally never repay. And your response is to go out and hassle somebody for 12 grand? Nah. And he throws him in jail. You and I owed a tremendous amount of debt on our lives. 
See, when sin entered the world, there was now a debt that needed to be paid because it caused eternal separation from God. And God looked down and it's like, this is a debt you can try. We can do animal sacrifices. You can bring in grain offerings and this and that and the other, but it's never gonna be enough. There's still gonna be a problem. And so he said, you know what? I'm gonna send my son to take your place, to die and to wipe your slate clean and to forgive every debt, every sin, past, present, and future. It's done, it's forgiven. There's nothing you and I could ever do to earn it, to deserve it, to pay it back. And that's what he did for you and I. He wiped the slate clean. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed in this room today, maybe you've been struggling with, with forgiving other people because you've not received the forgiveness of God. And let me be clear that you cannot do this without Him. Forgiving people is impossible without first receiving the forgiveness of God and inviting Him into your life. And if so, if that's you today, and you say, hey, I'm tired of doing this on my own. I have been struggling and nothing is working. If that's you and you say, I'm ready to surrender my life to God, to hand over the keys and the control and say, God, only you can bring healing and restoration in the places where I am hurt and broken. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? I'm not gonna embarrass you or make you come up front. What we're gonna do is we're all gonna pray together because we don't want anybody to pray alone. So would you repeat after me? Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I place my hope and trust in you. Thank you for dying in my place so that I could have new life. In Jesus' name. Thank you for checking out this week's message. If you made any decisions for Jesus or you need a next step or have a prayer request, let us know by going to www.propel.church hub. That leads you to our digital connect card where you can fill out all of that information as well as see what we have coming up here at Propel. Thank you again for tuning in and we hope to see you again soon.